Welcome back. In the first half, we heard from former mayor of London, Ken Livingston, about the dangers of air pollution that the World Health Organization says kills 4.2 million a year. But did the WHO, along with the UN, cover up another literally invisible threat to public health, low-level radiation? A new book proposes that a past of prolific nuclear weapons testing and a future of environmentalist catalyzed nuclear power commissioning might lead elites to suppress facts about the potentially deadly effects of low-level radiation. The book is a a manual for survival, a Chernobyl guide to the future. And its author, MIT professor Kate Brown, joins me now from Paris. Kate, welcome to Going Underground. So in discovering new information about uh, Chernobyl, you trace why the Earth exists today as if 29,000 Hiroshima bombs went off and uh, thyroid cancer tripling between 1974 and 2013, sperm count uh, declining in America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. How, how do you think it is that uh, more people don't know how Chernobyl, let alone other uh, disasters like Fukushima, have, uh, are emblematic of a kind of failure of human, uh, human organization in capitalism? Yeah, well, you, you know, it, it leads you to wonder. I went into the archives. First, I started in Kiev, then I went on to Minsk and Moscow. And what I learned is that you know, much of what we've been told about the Chernobyl disaster is just wrong or incomplete. People were far sicker. Far more people died than we've been told. Radioactivity was not contained inside the Chernobyl zone. In fact, I find that pilots went up and manipulated the weather so that radioactive rain fell on rural Belarus in order to save the big Russian cities. Nobody told the 200,000 people living under those rain clouds. And, you know, the, the story is just quite different when you look at the archival records. And I found I was the first person usually to check out these files. And I think that's why we haven't really known this story. Um, and then I went on to UN archives to say, you know, why don't we know about this big public health disaster? And I worked in five UN archives. And I found there that certain key influential individuals were helping the Soviet leadership minimize uh, the record of the health impacts of the disaster. And I found, you know, I was like, why would they do that? And I found that they were uh, the big, you know, nuclear powers, the UK, US, France, Russia, were facing lawsuits at the end of the Cold War from their own testing and production of nuclear weapons for, you know, 40 years prior to that. And what they had done, our, our leaders, in the name of, of peace and nuclear deterrence, they had, you know, emitted 500 times more radioactivity into the environment than Chernobyl. And, you know, I was left at the end of this book, Manual for Survival, wondering why we haven't been more curious as a society about our exposures to billions and billions of curies of radioactivity and nuclear fallout. Most people would think, well, this is a problem of Soviet communism in the USSR. Why I mentioned capitalism is because you say in the book there was a, quote, false impression that persisted and deepened that Western capitalist medicine was superior to medicine practice in the USSR in the immediate aftermath of Chernobyl. Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, the Soviets had a lot of uh, nuclear spills during the Cold War, a lot of accidents, and they had doctors who, uh, because they, the doctors were not privy to the, the radiation doses that their patients were getting, that was considered classified information, the doctors became extremely good at uh, detecting doses and um, symptoms in their patients um, just by, by studying their, mostly their, their blood, their you know, um, chromosomes, um, their blood counts, and looking at other sort of neurological factors, teeth enamel, things like that. So the Soviet doctors really had a, what I consider a, a more sensitive and um, more developed radiation medicine than those in the West. But as you know, at the end of the Soviet Union, everything that was Soviet was considered bad. The Soviets had bad politics, bad economics, and it followed that it was easy to slander Soviet medicine and science. And I find that that was, you know, the, the real um, tactic that Western experts um, came in and said, oh, you know, Soviet scientists, they don't know what they're talking about. These people out in the villages, um, they're we do find that there's a record of, of sickness, and they are sicker than they should be. But that's because they drink too much, they smoke too much, they have poor diets, and they have radiophobia. They're, they're just nervous about their exposure to radioactivity. Now, the book is structural in its blame, but you did mention the UN there. Uh, I mean, you say that the media took the figure of 54 deaths and 6,000 cases of thyroid cancer. And this was influenced by Fred Mettler, author of the IAEA, 
report. What is the role of uh, institutions like that in, in conveying to the media and then to the wider public actual facts? Well, they wrote the big reports. They, they, wrote, they authored the first uh, big UN report was after uh, the UN consultants did a study of about uh, 1,600 people in the Chernobyl contaminated territories. They did that in 1990. They issued a report in 1991. Other reports followed in 1996, and the, and the big one in 2006, the Chernobyl Forum report. And they kept really enunciating the same kinds of message. At first, they said in 1991, we found no record of damage, and we don't expect to see anything but a few childhood thyroid cancers in the future. And then in 2006, that's, they repeated the same message, 54 people dead, um, 6,000 kids with thyroid cancer, and really no other detectable impact from Chernobyl. Now, the Ukrainian officials have a count of 35,000 people receive compensation because their spouse died from a Chernobyl-related illness. Now, that's just people old enough to have married. It doesn't include children who have died, people who are widowed or unmarried. Um, the unofficial count in Ukraine alone is 150,000 dead, and that is Ukraine, which received the least amount of radioactive contamination. Belarus, Western Russia received far more. So that's a minimum number. 35 to 100,000 dead from Chernobyl. But then, I mean, even as recently as Fukushima, the way that uh, mainstream media have talked about accidents uh, is always that uh, there can be high radiation, then there's less radiation, and then it becomes safe. You seem to suggest that there are a U.S. government cover-up that benefits uh, uh, the promotion uh, of an idea that um, everything from medical tests to atomic tests are safe by saying low-level radiation is not dangerous? Well, yeah. There, I mean, the U.S. government was involved in um, hiding evidence and denying evidence of their own testing of nuclear weapons in the American heartland, right in Nevada. The Americans were... The Americans and the Soviets were the only people brave enough to have uh, nuclear test sites blowing up bombs in their continental heartland. Um, so they were busy in the early 1990s trying to cover that story up because they wanted to avoid billion-dollar lawsuits. Uh, the French government was engaged in this kind of activity about Algeria and uh, French Polynesia. The British government had de detonated bombs also in the South Pacific and in Western Australia. Nobody wanted these lawsuits to come home to roost. And so if you could say Chernobyl was the worst accident in human history, worst nuclear accident in human history, and only 35 people died or 54 people died and 6,000 kids got easily treatable cancers, then hopefully those lawsuits could go away and the, the whole record of, um, of nuclear testing could go away. And that's indeed what happened in the early 1990s um, by defeating Chernobyl, uh, making sure that to, you know, low dose uh, impact on health had no precedent, they were managed to slip away from those lawsuits. So in that sense, it was mission accomplished. Except that records stay in the archives for a long time, and after 20 and 30 years, historians get to see them, and then we see, you know, what happened in the past. And to be clear, you uh, explain how radioactivity was driven right through the food chain using uh, uh, affected uh, insect pollinators, and to the point that uh, the European, through the European Union, there are berries on the shelves that now have uh, radioactivity that you can trace to Chernobyl. Right. Yeah, I went, after I worked in the Ministry of Health Archives, I went to the Ministry of Agriculture Archives, you know, during the Soviet period. And what I find is that a, a good portion of the food chain was saturated with radioactive contaminants, milk, uh, wheat, honey, wool, uh, wood, you know, sort of you name it, it was emanating radioactivity. They even find in some areas of southern Belarus, 22 percent of women's m breast milk was contaminated above permissible levels for radioactivity. And, and that's a pretty amazing thing when society has to set permissible levels of radioactivity for women's breast milk. Since uh, Ukraine joined the European Association in 2014, they have been um, sending uh, agricultural produce over the border to Poland to be marketed in the EU and then globally. And I found that thousands of people are picking uh, blueberries from the Pripyat marshes. That's, you know, between 200 and, and, you know, 50 kilometers from the Chernobyl plant. And because the swamp circulates radioactivity, 
And because blueberries soak up uh, minerals and radioactive mimics of minerals so well, those berries are radioactive. All of them are radioactive. Some are really radioactive. They pick them all. They get a, they get a mix to reach the permissible norm. And then it goes globally. And I found that um, these radioactive berries were crossing in trucks from Canada into the U.S. And the, the border guards, the nuclear security border guards, stopped them because they found this radiating mass in a truck. They look in. Blueberries from Ukraine, they're within permissible limits, and in they go. Now, I'm not saying that these berries are necessarily, if you eat them in small quantities, they're terribly dangerous for us. But what my thought is, is that rather than take radioactive produce from the contaminated territories and send the, the, the radioactivity around the world, it'd be better just to pay those pickers to pick those berries and then dispose of them as nuclear waste, which is indeed what they are. Just finally, there is a class dimension to your book, quite right outside the globalization there, that you, you just Im implied. You say that in the immediate aftermath, the IMF economic disaster brought upon the former Soviet Union, you couldn't tell whether it was nuclear catastrophe or economic catastrophe. Does the radiation today affect the poor more than the rich? It tends to. If you look around the map of the globe, uh, Nuclear power plants tend to be put in jobless areas. They're not um, in, near big, you know, popular and wealthy places. They usually um, put them in places where people are dying for jobs, and they call them nuclear villages, and they give them perks. They give nuclear employees perks like child care and, and a little bit higher wages and nice municipal uh, facilities. And so when accidents happen, they tend to happen in poor, more rural places. Take Chernobyl, take Fukushima, take the wind scale accidents up in uh, northern England, and all of our problems out in the American West. Uh, yeah, there, this is an, a, an issue of environmental justice as well. Professor Kate Brown, thank you.